when it comes to, you know, for example, I was listening to the unheard interview with Ayala. Uh, you were saying about how OnlyFans wrestles control away from the porn producers, whoever they may be, Zero HP Lovecraft uh, in the chat, uh, the porn producers that have historically exploited young women and the sort of the very vicious uh, cycle that goes into a lot of like mainstream pornography. The argument that you posited was that it wrestles control away from direct exploitation and it gives uh, people producing pornographic content control over their own output and what they're cool with doing. And they're no longer um, apart from like just brute market incentives. They're no longer subject to being forced to do things against their will or against their own personal limitations. But what would you say to someone like me who would say that, in a way, it's almost like rationalizing uh, a form of internalized servitude and exploitation to market forces that eventually demand that, like, okay, Ayala does more extreme stuff, and therefore, to pursue an economic interest, you're going to consent to that, but you're basically you're being tricked into what you think is liberation by something that opens the door for more nuanced forms of exploitation that is based, based around that's, your participation that's, in it. That, that's a established feminist uh, point, actually. Yeah, this what is like mean? classic. Any pornography is ultimately, wave. yeah, it's going to be yeah. exploited in a capitalist context. But, but furthermore, do you think, Ayala, that... I think what Lev is asking is fundamentally the question around human value. Now, you have... I, without mischaracterizing, you have more of a materialistic base, not materialistic, but like um, you have more of a uh, rationalistic basis of human value. And for someone like me, who is who's still a very religious person um, who believes in sort of a metaphysical view of human nature, I, I think that the sort of display of one's own sexuality without the context of ritual and without the context of intimacy is sort of like creating a weird form of the the marketization of intimacy and to me it's like that's even greater than of a horror than even you know pornography just seeing people fucking because seeing people fucking is one thing but like seeing someone larp as an intimate relation and commodifying that to me i feel mm -hmm. is a very huge detriment for both men and women and I, I just, I'm curious because you, Ayala, I think you're the perfect person to argue with about this because you have thought about this immensely and your experiences have um, contributed to your worldview of the, so just go ahead. Yeah. What, what do you think of someone like me who's very critical of, uh, of uh, why, for lab, what you're doing or whatever? Um, <laughs> I think that it is true that for some people commoditizing sex, like makes it not special. So I think it's probably a probably large subset of the population um, where if they like had to do an OnlyFans or something, they would have a lot of trauma from it and they probably shouldn't do it. Uh, so if that's what you're saying, I agree with you. Um, I also, I think I generally like am really into, I, it's gonna sound cheesy, but informed consent uh, financially as well. If you know clearly what you're doing and you decide that the benefits are worth it to you, uh, then it's your responsibility, what your choice is. And so when you're talking about people like glamorizing sex work or something, my concern is, is there deception? And if there's deception, then it's not informed consent and I, and I don't agree with it. And I would probably agree with you that this is bad. Um, but if somebody's presented like an accurate summary of the facts, uh, like, yes, there is a market incentive. If you, you know, perform these sex acts, if you have a, this a chance of earning between this amount of money um, and then they ch choose to, like, it feels very strange to me to tell them that they're doing something wrong. Uh, it's, it's like sort of like a stepping over a boundary that I don't really feel comfortable doing. But but, the, but again, this is an argument, which I was ironic, unironically defending before last hour. This is an argument sort of against this, like, affirmative consent model that has led to more nuanced forms of exploitation. Even if people aren't being deceived, do you think that there is a cheapening of yourself going on by putting yourself out there in such a gratuitous, for lack of a better term, gratuitous form of uh, a display, whether through only what fans or what. Yeah. Do you, do you think that um, there is a sense where 
your capacity for uh, things like intimacy and interpersonal connection, they're sort of being violated by cons- ultimately consenting to yourself as a product, as a, you know, a person who is producing something that historically and for good reasons has been one of the most intimate spaces of human existence which is our sexuality do you think that even if women or men or whoever are producing this with full knowledge and full control over their own product and without any sort of exploitation do you still feel that there's a sense of there's sort of a reason why we have a sort of shame and embarrassment around these things because they're they speak to ourselves on such a fundamental Mm -hmm. level that it's like almost in a way by fully accepting a pornographizing of society for lack of a better term, then it's, it's like we're losing our own capacity to view each other as something almost like mysterious and not just mysterious, but also as having a capacity towards something greater than just our brute attractiveness that is being, you know, marketed to people. So it's like, lot like this cat for instance look yeah. how mysterious yeah. like it is. in other words i guess what i'm no, trying we, to say is there's a yeah, distinction you're... between like what is erotica and what is pornography like you know so i, I as an artist i think about this all the time but, but so I, quickly, you're saying something like if people are engaging in consuming in sex work then mm-hmm. in their personal lives they are going to experience less pleasure and meaningfulness around intimacy not just around intimacy but also just around um the, the way we relate to each other in general, I guess you could say. He's saying, like, if you take, like, the fact that interpersonal relationships and sexuality, what have you, is basically, like, uh, priceless, right? And you literally put a price on it, then does that not cheapen it from having its, you know, m- greater, you know, more ephemeral, like, qualities? He's saying... The, the, the... I mean, do you think sexuality didn't have a price on it before? He's saying... Well, mm-hmm. no, but you're he's asking, are you cheapening it by literally making it like a, a material commodity to buy well i don't think Ayala is adap- cheapening uh, adap- anything adap- yeah she's not cheapening anything well and not her in particular because she does fairly well but i'm saying <laughs> more broadly yes does are you by making it a literal good or you can trade does that not cheapen the overall I, I, I I think it enhances want- it does the opposite makes it more expensive, makes it more valuable, gives it value. Well, Does the, it? If the I value by what trade, metric? That's the argument. If I, I was, before, at some point in time, I would have to trade land and dowry and all kinds of other things to give you essentially lifelong, uh, you know, support. And now I can basically pay $40 for an Uber or like two five ninety nine a month. Like it's, it's definitely cheapened. Like I don't wait, need to like zero right. HP has wait. a comment, by the way. Wait, 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 let Ayala finish yes. your point. Okay. Then we'll go to this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Zero HP. yeah. Um, sorry, I got distracted right before I was going to talk. <laughs> One, we keep using the word cheapening, um, and I sort of want to like, replace it with something more concrete because it's like sort of like this, this vague like sense, right? And I want to have something like specific. Like, do we mean that like now I am unable to get a high value mate because I'm doing sex work, and this is what cheapening means? Like, like now that my like sex or whatever is uh, like less powerful in the actual like relationship marketplace. Like, is that what we mean? Um, uh that, that one, is one consequence one of the yeah. of the cheapening the cheapening would be that like there used to be like a more instead of a priceless instead of sexuality being a priceless like uh like addition to the fact that like you as a person i have to like you know make some kind of commitment by taking it and turning it into a literal commodity like you know and anything else you would trade does this cheapen it from this abstract like more abstract notion like platonic ideal and bring it down to like literal discrete qualities and like that that dem, dem, it being demoted i had a lot of cold brew it being demoted does that like actually literally cheapen it and make it so that now everyone else also has to suffer from this right like i again as i just said like i don't have to take girls on dates and i could just get a, a uber to my apartment if i wanted like you know what i mean like th- that's not how it worked like what like an Uber, like if you, if you pay them, you could have sex with them. Is that what you're saying? No, but I'm saying like there used to be a time where I have to like court someone and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Now I can get on an You're app and literally just and the, order and you the essentially. Super to come Iron over. Bob, he has a ten dollar comment. So Super Iron Bob, thank you so much for the donation. He says, "How does going on dates and then ghosting from dating sites just for the meal differ in this equation? How does trading a one night stand for that same meal work?" Interesting. Uh, 
see, is he agreeing with me or disagreeing? By I think he's agreeing a, with you, actually. No, I think he's agreeing with well. me. Yeah, the, the, it's it's lowered it essentially to like forty dollars worth of like dinner. That's but like the market price. You guys are talking about casual sex. Like people still court each other and marry and have long term mm. investments in each other. Not you know, really. But, yes, yes. Comparatively. <laughs> It's it's going marriage down. Is down marriage is down like fifty percent. Like let's say the black community, black community used to have eighty percent mm. marriage rate like f- before crack epidemic is now mm. down to twenty percent. One in four black women get married in their lifetime, right? Let's Very if sad. You did it in I know, but this is the case with literally all communities. The black community is just like ten years ahead typically with trends, right? So like if that's happening in the black community now, that means in like ten or so years, middle America is going to deal with the same exact problem. Uh, I, I, uh, this is this is due to the the gender imbalance in, in the black community because so many are incarcerated, so many men. If yeah. you have a whole bunch of women and not partially, a lot of, um, you're not going to see a lot of marriage because why would a man marry when he can like have sex with a bunch of women? I think we would see this in any community where you remove a percentage of the men. Uh, so if you do that, if, to bring it back to the earlier point, right? In that apps have created a very liquid market, right, and for the sexual marketplace, and literally like ten percent of men are having sex with all the other women. Like well, 90% it's gamified of relationships are, to yeah, an extent. Yeah, so like 90% of men are 80, let's say be charitable, 70% of men are removed mm. from the dating pool like f- for viability. So now you've created that same imbalance on the entire uh, sexual marketplace via apps um, and the liquid market of that liquid nature. Not necessarily. More, more women reproduce than men. Um, and there, there, women are preferred to like have like a smaller percentage of men than men prefer women. This is true. Um, but this is in context for the men that are rejected. Like there's high pressure on the men uh, because if they slip a little bit, they will become one of like the 80% that fail. Uh, so so the, the existence of the failures is still important for like the, the success. Like there's it's this tension between the two that, that like, creates like the like male commitment, for example. Like a man's going to commit because if he doesn't, somebody else is going to step up and take his place. It only happens when you actually like remove men from the equation, from the competition entirely, that you get this t- type of like family imbalance. But, but when you were arguing before for the against side, you, you brought up the fact that the 80-20 rule statistically is pretty much reality. I mean, I know it's like a meme, like incel meme, whatever. But do you think that in, in some ways um, there, there has been a lot of negative outcomes, even on like a less in, tangible level in terms of the ways in which mass uh, access to pornography at earlier ages has sort of warped um, – the views that men have towards women and vice versa, even, do you think that there's a negative outcome when say um, a a woman who is, I don't know, 15 years old, who uh, their first boyfriend in high school wants them to perform, I don't know, I don't want to go into it, you know, anal sex or whatever, or bondage, or if, you know, the, the girl that got choked out because of the 50 shades of gray. Do, Do you think that there's a negative outcome across the board with having a society that, um, doesn't, views pornography not as an issue of human intimacy but rather more of like an economic issue of just like want and need and access and like you know supply and demand maybe there there might be downstream negative ripple effects mm-hmm. i don't know stats um if so, if you presented me a study that said like a- exposure to pornography like decreases male long-term satisfaction in a romantic mm-hmm. relationship um, I wouldn't be like that surprised. I would be surprised if it were like a very significant impact, but I would not be surprised if it were small. Right. But I think another argument I would ask, or rather I would run by you, would be that um, when we're talking about, you said you want something more concrete than just cheapening and what we, we mean by value. I think that the structure in general of the last, I would say, hundred or so years of the way marriage and courtship and relationships happen is decoupled from much older conceptions of belonging within a community like you know like the heideggerian notion of community of mortals like we are uh these being we are thrown in a context a social context and we are being towards death and we have to band together in certain ways and a lot of these relationships were much more fluid between people within a certain tribe or social arrangement and therefore there was a lot of impersonal metrics that determined who, what type of people got together but now that we have a purely consent based negative conception of how you go about relate like how you go about you know having sex or having a relationship with someone that in a way opens the door for this very like 
weird atomized view of the subject that unfortunately the sort of atomic family uh was the beginning of the end into like the atomic the 50s like fucking leave it to beaver atomic family that to me uh from my you know whatever base trad reactionary perspective whatever to me that was like almost a symptom of this increasing atomization and so when we're talking about how people pair bond even like the to me the language of like pair bonding and consent and so forth that doesn't really capture the picture of what a healthy sort of relationship within a society could be because now it's like we're just talking about horse trading again (laughs) In a, in a strange way, it's like this whole thing about bribing each other in dowries and horse trading between men and women. It's almost like a weird postmodern return of that, but we're doing it within the language of liberation. So I think there's, I, I don't know. I, sorry, just stop me. I know I'm, this is totally abstract. And I know that you want, you're someone that thinks within concrete um, framework of statistics and so forth, but yeah. Yeah, I agree that a lot of the changes that have happened with a, like an advanced society has caused like a whole bunch of like damaging effects on uh, culture and community. Uh, if that's your point, I do agree with this. Yeah, but but then again, um, all right, I'll be right back. Yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. Minutes. Sorry, um, Lev, you wanted. I to... guess it uh, talks more to me about. Uh, what responsibilities do all of us have as far as the messages that we go, uh, that that we let out? Because I agree with you, Ala, that people, they are individuals, they are free agents to choose whatever they want to. And I completely agree with you that unless, uh, you know, unless you're uh, intentionally mischaracterizing something, tricking somebody into doing something, if you're just laying it out there and saying, this is the reality here, folks. This is what you can get, and this is how you can get it. This is free information available for everybody, and I think that there is nothing wrong with that at all. I am a fan of Sci-Hub, for instance, opening up right now for people to be able to download all these various articles that are you know, otherwise uh, kept only for the elite few. So I like this kind of stuff. At the same time, when I look at all these different aspects of culture, like back in the 20s, the roaring 20s, You know, we had people who were doing a lot of boozing it up. We had people who were going into the Chinese opium dens. And that was considered to be a standard thing that every hip young person uh, wanted to do. And if we were around that time, would we then say, like, uh, I am not going to dissuade this person from ingesting the substance because they are a free agent. It's their responsibility. And at that point, what I'm getting to here, Ella, is... Where exactly is our responsibility as a person, regardless of the free agency of people, to have some system that we can kind of rely on inside of ourselves to tell us what is right and what is wrong? Where maybe people can make money from pornography, and if they are beautiful, and you are very beautiful, Ayala, by the way, I don't mean to simp, but I just want to say, Lev, you are please very don't attractive even. Young. Don't... Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into it right now. But the oh, point is, is that there are very beautiful people out there who can make a lot of money from this stuff, just as there are people out there who can go out and do drugs and uh, do all kinds of other things. And the question is, what is in each of us the moral responsibility here for, you know, either advocating for it? advocating against it or being kind of like i don't know i think alexander bard who we had on he's an amazing guy and he's also very big proponent of sex work by the way and he is a btr regular we're going to have him on real soon as well again but i think his thing is that there are specific people and i guess he calls them kind of like a tantric practitioners like there are people out there who are connected to some other world who he sees as being a lot of the people that you do find within sex work and pornography people who are outsiders people who are who are within like this um this outer rim and it seems like the way that culture went with the roaring 20s and uh, booze and drugs and the way it went in the 60s with psychedelics, uh, well, a lot of other h- hard drugs, you know, back then, uh, cocaine, things of that nature. It seems like now things are going that direction, at least as a normie observer, uh, me being the normie in this case, compared to the world that you're in. Uh, it seems like something like OnlyFans is also showing itself to be this thing that uh, you know if you are beautiful and glamorous and again i know you're against trickery so no trickery if you are beautiful and glamorous and you can go in there make money and uh it, it, it glamorizes that aspect of it so again where do you see uh the uh 
the right moral stance to uh, to take in this case? I think that it is um, not immediately clear. Uh, I mean, obviously, like, I don't think that OnlyFans is immoral. I don't think that partic participating in OnlyFans is immoral. Um, I'm also a moral nihilist, uh, but I still like doing things that make me feel good. And what makes oh, me feel God. good is often <laughs> other people feel good. Um, and so, so when it comes to like sex work and stuff, I find that uh, often people sort of misjudge uh, the way that other people's minds work because it's really common. Um, and I think that like if you were accurate in what you thought the things other people's minds were doing, then I would probably agree with you a lot more. Um, but like for me specifically, I I feel pretty self aware. Um, and I feel good about it. Like, I'm not gonna like sugarcoat, there are some things I don't like. Um, there are downsides uh, and there are ways that it have affected my personal life. Um, and I consider it overall to be like one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life. And- Well, you talked about in your guide, I was reading about the tips for uh, women getting into this. So about how it could yeah. potentially if negatively. So you are, you're very honest about, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Right. So like, I mean, you are, you're not like a hundred percent wrong. Like, I'm not like, Oh, nothing you say is correct. Cause like, yeah, it sucks for some people. Some people get into sex work and then find that like, it's just taking an emotional toll that they really can't handle. Um, and likely those people probably shouldn't be doing sex work. A lot of people don't feel this way. Also a lot of men are able to consume pornography in a healthy way. Um, I think likely more men than you suspect. I would guess that like we both have like different predictions about how men can, can pursue it. Uh, I do agree that there's like a lot of uh, confusion and rough edges when you like sort of transfer or change culture. So like if you have a whole bunch of people who are used to like a certain type of sexual norm and then you introduce a different sexual norm, uh, you're going to see a lot of problems for a while until people sort of get used to it and it gets integrated. And I do think that like um, for communities I've seen that seem to have really integrated sex positivity in like sort of a long-term way, like they've been growing their whole lives in this sort of thing um this is just sort of like a permanent like back fixture for them they seem to have like in my personal experience again it's not like statistically relevant uh but they seem to have way far fewer uh, uh way fewer psychological issues with it than other people um also wait, wait, what do you mean by communities out of curiosity do you mean like local like communes or just like decentralized people online when you say um, communities Various friend circles I've run it. So like uh, some burner communities, some of the rationalists, some kink communities, um, a little bit of dancing too. Um, yeah, they, they seem to be, it seems to be like relatively sustainable. Um, I'm saying like it kind of vaguely here, uh, but like, but I have personally experienced like really, really positive relationships that feel like genuinely healthy through and through in sex work. And, and often I feel like the criticisms of sex work like fail to recognize that sex work is perfor performing like a really important service for a lot of people. And yeah, it has downsides and also like it is vital. Like I suspect, like I have probably helped some people not kill themselves. And and like, you can't like take that meaning away from me or from like people I know who've had similar experiences. But don't you think that it's more of an, an indictment on society in general that um, certainly certain forms of alienated men have are driven to towards prostitution and sex work and so forth that instead of having sort of a, a healthier social arrangement that we have to sort of utilize this emotional labor to like, you know, I mean, LARP and pretend to be intimate with people. I mean, to me, it just seems kind of alienating, but, but I, I mean, it's, it's not yeah. a sex worker's fault that, you know, some men have issues, you know, there are going to always be like unhealthy people out there and there's always going to be sex workers, you know, and sometimes like the combinations are always very toxic, but it's not but, the sex worker's fault. And yeah, but, sex but sex workers, workers they've, they've had different sort of, they have a di oh, so different I, function. I I don't oh, know nice. Oh, let's take a look. Hold on there. Yeah, I'll, I'll post it. It's a little bit, uh, yeah, post it. It's a little bit too digital. bright. Or, yeah. So she can post in the chat. Um, no, but I mean, there, there was throughout history, there, there were like, um, temple prostitutes and sacred prostitutes and so forth yeah. that did have a social function well sacred but, is the key word here though right because there was yeah, a but ritual that, and but again this is like a pre-christian yeah. conception of of it so as for the argument that you know people are well adjusted right, in take these a look communities, at that. yeah go, look, sorry go ahead. look at that that is beautiful 
Check that Wait, did out. You, did you? Oh, there we go. Wow. Nice. Ayla, you got two <laughs> paintings. You got two paintings in one go. So you got uh, Alexander's beautiful painting, and also my father did that painting of you with the uh, the Geo necklace <laughs> on the cover. Thank you so much. Oh. That's really cool. You're and so fast too. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, but but I'm curious to know. I mean, the argument could be that, well. If, if we were to sort of hard test it with these groups, then it could apply to everybody. But I, I don't know. I still think that there's something in the pit of the, you know, human soul that, that creates a lot of these taboos around sexuality for obvious reasons. But I'm curious to know your argument. Um, why to you, what is moral nihilism and, and how do you uh, not just justify, I mean, you know, the typical argument of like, well, how come you don't do bad things, blah, blah, blah. I, I know like why, you know, people don't do bad things. There's a lot of social pressure and so forth, but why, why, how have you come to sort of the conclusion of moral nihilism and how do you think that it is a, maybe not an ethic, an anti-ethic that can benefit people as someone who is, you know, ostensibly the total opposite of moral nihilist. So I'm very curious. Um, I mean, I don't mean that like in a fucking facetious way. I am generally curious about, y yeah. Well, I just wanted to make that point clear. I'm not like, I'm not trying to irony post here. I am curious uh, how, you know, how you've gone about that. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut up now. Sorry. Um, so to, to start, I seem to behave like very morally. Uh, like if you would measure my behavior, I think that like uh, probably above average, possibly. Uh, I tend to be like extremely against things like, uh, lying in dishonesty, even when it strongly inconveniences me. Um, and I go out of my way to do things like, you know, return wallets or whatever, um, even when nobody's looking. Uh, so so to start, I, I want to say that I'm not like, although I do sex work, so maybe. <laughs> maybe that, well, we're going to debate that. So. Um, but I, I just want to say that like, like my view, like when I talk about my views, keep in mind that like this, like uh, I'm, I'm not like stabbing people and stealing money or anything. Um, but I don't really experience the sensation of uh, morality at all. Um, very rarely, occasionally, maybe like once or twice a month, um, I experience a sense of like a moral thing inside me. And when people talk about like uh, that, <laughs> I don't really understand. Um, it's like it doesn't tap into something in my head. Okay, so for, uh, then, for example, if you were to do something real shitty to somebody, would you then have something inside of you that just kept you up at night and think like, shit, like, why did I do that to this person? You know, like that kind of, it's almost like a physical feeling, like an ache. I don't know. Is there, is there something similar that you would experience in that case? Like if you were to be shitty to somebody? Sometimes, sometimes I feel like empathy for the person if I've hurt them. Um, like it, if I hurt somebody, often it will hurt me and I'll be like, ah. Oh. That's painful. Yeah, yeah. There, there we <laughs> that's go. Yeah. to not hurt someone. Um, that's usually what goes on. So, uh, so that's it. That's the morality. I mean, I don't really know well, why. Why is that morality? Because I think that morality is something that, uh, through that feeling, lets you know if something that you did is, uh, you know, morally. That's a moral intuitionism. But yeah. Ella is saying she doesn't have that. But so, uh, if you well, don't I have feel it's like pain and pleasure, basically. But can you, but can you really create maybe not a morality, but an ethics based purely on pain and pleasure? Like that's the old utilitarian sort of bugaboo of like, can pleasure and pain, like this is going back to like fucking the Nicromachean ethics, right? Like, can you create a social fabric from just merely the cessation of pain and the pursuit of pleasure? I'm not, I'm not trying to create a moral framework. I have none. No, no, sorry, ethical framework, not moral, not moral. Um, what do you mean by ethics? I'm sorry, that's a, a dumb question. Um, God, see, it's one of those things where, you know, but then it's like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's something that is a codification of behavior as opposed to what we feel as morality in terms of the impulse towards what we conceive of as right and wrong. It's more ethics is sort of like behavior within a society that we've codified, that we've arranged as being acceptable, um, behavior and action and so forth whereas morality is something different um yeah 
Okay, morality so I think is something much what more. People agree is acceptable, like social norms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, yes. Um, ethics are more the codification of social norms and how we exist interpersonally, whereas morality, typically the way people frame it colloquially, is something that is inside and something that we feel is like a conscious weighing upon a conscience weighing upon us. So, in in a way, you could say that ethics and morality they are correlated, but they're not like. So, like they're sufficient together but they're not like necessarily together okay what, what was the original question um if you could base um a, an ethical social arrangement purely on this principle that you are a moral nihilist and not just your moralist but rather you pursue pleasure and avoid pain like the old like you you know Stuart mill utilitarian metric if so if i had to make rules for people yeah like how can you from your position as a moral nihilist um create an ethics that is like a sense ostensibly making rules for people i guess that's a very basic yeah well it would be like trying to figure out what i want um and usually this comes down to stuff like i would like people to have a lot of freedom uh that sound, that would make me feel good like the thought of like going entering a society where there's like everybody's very free like makes me feel like really great in my body. Um, I like when people uh, are self-exploratory and honest with each other. That makes me feel good. Um, is this the kind how, of- How do you define no. freedom, by the way? I'm really curious about that. How would you define freedom? It's oh, a hard one. It is a hard um, one, I know. But also, are you an egoist? Like, like, I, like, huh? No, are you an egoist then? Like you feel that, like, like you're more of like, within that moral nihilism you believe in a form of ethical egoism um what is ethical egoism well oh, fuck. it's it's like um sorry i know i know it's it's really i'm, I'm flustered at, but essentially you believe that your will and your ego has a certain power and you have a right to express your wants and feelings and I, I really don't want to, like, you know, I'm just going to look up the fucking Wikipedia definition. Yeah. But essentially, you feel that it's ethical and it's proper behavior to pursue your own interests. I like pursuing my own interests. Well, yeah. then, well, then getting back to the freedom thing, the reason why I ask this is because there was an interesting um, talk that I um, was listening to about freedom and uh, what exactly freedom meant at different times. So at certain times, freedom, not only did it mean freedom from, let's say, tyranny, from having somebody's boot on your shoulder or whatever, but it also meant freedom from uh, desire, freedom from, you know, having yourself uh, be cast into, you know, one, uh, you, you know, grappling like, for something. Yeah, this is the, ba yeah. the basic St. Paul argument that, that what you think is freedom is actually you're being enslaved to the passions. Libido yeah, dominandi. Exactly. Yeah, Libido Nominati, exactly. Yeah, the E. Michael Jones, like St. Paul argument that, that, you know, you're enslaved to your passions and that sin is a form of inner slavery, even though you think you're free. It's, uh, I'm sure, but again, you've heard all of this before, so it's kind of like, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, my conception of freedom is basically just, uh, like, uh, I don't think it's like a super coherent concept, but it seems useful and... Uh, like you know the positive negative rights like uh people like don't take your stuff and don't like hurt your body um and something i'm not sure that it's fully explored but i, I like the idea of property ownership um and having rights over your property feels good but but do you think that you know you come across and again i don't mean to be overtly critical but you come across, you say, I'm an ethical, I'm, I'm moral nihilist, i don't believe in a morality but do you think that reason informs your sense of action and behavior and comportment do you think that reason is a basis or do you believe in more of a total uh, moral nihilism where reason has no part in it it's just like reason almost justifies our actions it's not like nietzsche said after a while when we start to rationalize we can't tell the difference between what is actual reason and just being a rationalization after the fact so do you think that reason plays into your conception of how you behave or reason is, is just like a way of i don't know justifying what you do or what anyone does 
I'm not totally sure. It's, I, I suspect so. Like a lot of the time I have like a faint idea of what like might make me feel good, but it takes like a lot of uh, thinking to try and figure out how to get to that point or like even to uh, uncover what it is to myself that I actually want. And so I use uh, thinking, the thinking part of my brain, if that's what you're asking. Mm. So, so in a way, reason is sort of like a grounding of how you determine what is the best action for you to pursue? I mean, I pay attention to like my, my, like the felt sense, like in sort of like the back of my head and like down the front of my chest is usually where it is. And it feels like, like a pulling towards or pushing away. And then Kundalini if I think of it, I, like, I don't know if big Yud would approve. I don't think that's very rationalist of you. That's no, Kundalini, I'm that's a Kundalini, Kundalini snake in reverse. It's a loose. I think, yeah, I think Ayala's it's Kundalini is Kundalini. <laughs> Ayala, have you ever had a Kundalini experience? I don't know. I thought I might've probably been, I'm sure. Cool. Yeah. I don't know if you ever delved into like tantric sex, any of that kind of stuff. Mm -mm. No. Okay. Well, there's there, there's always uh, there's always time and uh, verse. Well, she's uh, going she's going to get an OnlyFans request to do uh, tantric yoga, and so she will have to uh, brush up on her. Um, you know, you know, apparently they say the Kama Sutra isn't even canon. It was actually created by. Bon uh, I'm not the bonk, Geo. You're about to get the, the the bonk, the official. Yeah, bonk. they they say the Kama Sutra was created by British colonialists, like. Uh, Sir Richard Burton, it actually wasn't mm -hmm. a real yeah. Hindu text, but I don't know if that's true. No, 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 it was no, a real was Hindu real. text. Yeah. yeah. It's a, oh, okay. It's well, but the way it was in the way it was interpreted was by prolific uh, colonialist perverts yeah. like Richard Burton <laughs> yeah, going yeah, no, no. They, having they sex with out, beautiful women around. They the world. left out a lot of things, um, mm -hmm. according to uh, this uh, wonderful uh, Hindu girl who I know. Uh, they left out. Yeah, Based. they left out a lot of things having to do with just forming your life properly like certain traditions that you should occupy your time with all was that she a brahmin was... lev was she a brahmin yes all that <laughs> oh dude was... how did i know that how did i know that lev how did i know that yes, her, um, her her <laughs> grandfather was a pandit Sorry. her grandfather was a pandit oh uh, even better even yes, better <laughs> yes but but anyway the idea so... here the idea here is that in the Kama Sutra, it's supposed to talk about just like how do you base your whole life around like uh, how do you have relationships, how do you have sex, but beyond sex, just like how do you go about living in a married life? And That's so, so I think that there is a thirst out there for wisdom, not even a thirst. I'd say there is an ignorance of wisdom. People don't really like to listen to the wisdom of their elders, uh, especially today. You know, it's like uh, from that Clockwork Orange trope with the bum. He's talking about, you know, men on the moon, men spinning around the earth. Earth, and there's no attention paid to earthly law and order no more. Well, anyway, I'm not going to get into the Clark Orange thing. The point is, is that, uh, oh yeah, he says uh, it lets the uh, you it lets the old get out of the young. Never mind. Anyway, verse, you're back, yes. and I would love uh, uh, to hear your uh, also opinions of what we just talked about uh, right now about being slaves to your libidinal drives. Yeah, and um, that uh you know the compulsion towards pornography is is more uh you know a uh, shackle than it is some kind of liberation but yeah i mean there's that but then uh, more more since we have like a uh, more than just like being a dude on the internet and seeing porn all the time like you there is a uh parasocial nature to like to like the whole you know only fans and pornography thing that kind of also i think contributes to like alienation society so and also of course like there's if I'm trying to be like more chart like more um global in my thinking there's also like the whole it like f not only fans particularly but like online pornography like facilitates sex trafficking on a large scale and you know a lot of other l major issues so it's like not that I'm on my moral high horse but also like you know I don't think it's particularly uh beneficial to society but uh, yeah, that, that's where I'm me trying to be like respectful. That's how I will describe it. That's where that's yeah, that's my point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not long winded. 